I love making tools and sharing them with people. I remember as a child, my first tool I built was actually a microscope that I built by stealing lenses from my brother's eyeglasses. <laughs> He wasn't that thrilled. But you know, maybe because of that moment, 30 years later, I'm still making microscopes. And the reason I built these tools is for moments like this. Pass this one around to everybody. I have black things in my hair and blonde. <laughs> this is a school in Bay Area. The living world far supersedes our imagination of how things actually work. Oh my God! You see the perfect man. Right. Oh my God. I hadn't realized this would be such a universal phrase. Over the last two years, in my lab, we built 50,000 full scopes and shipped them to 130 countries in the world, at no cost to the kids we sent them to. This year alone, with the support of our community, we are planning to ship a million microscopes to kids around the world. What does that do? It creates an inspiring community of people around the world learning and teaching each other, from Kenya to Kampala to Kathmandu to Kansas. And one of the phenomenal things that I love about this is the sense of community. There is a kid in Nicaragua teaching others how to identify mosquito species that carry dengue by looking at the larva under a microscope. There is a pharmacologist who came up with a new way to detect fake drugs anywhere. There is a girl who wondered how does glitter actually work and discovered the physics of crystalline formation in glitter. There is an Argentinian doctor who's trying to do field cervical cancer screening with this tool, and yours very truly found a species of flea that was dug inside my heel in my foot, one centimeter deep. Now, you might think of these as、uh, anomalies. But there is a method to this madness. I call this frugal science. The idea of sharing experience of science and not just the information. Remind you, there are a billion people on this planet who live with absolutely no infrastructure, no roads, no electricity, and thus no health care. Also, there are a billion kids on this planet that live in poverty. How are we supposed to inspire them for the next generation of solution makers? There are healthcare workers that we put on the line to fight for infectious diseases to protect us with absolutely bare minimum tools and resources. So, as a lab at Stanford,、uh, I think of this from a context of frugal science and building solutions for these communities. Often, we think about being able to do diagnosis under a tree, off grid. I'll tell you two examples today of new tools. One of them starts in Uganda. In 2013, on a field trip to detect schistosomiasis with foldscopes, I made a, a minor observation. In a clinic, in a far remote area, I saw a centrifuge being used as a doorstop. I mean, quite literally, the doorstop. And I asked them, and they said, "Oh, we don't actually have electricity, so this piece of..." Junk is is good as a doorstop. You know, centrifuges. For some of you who don't know, are the pinnacle tool to be able to do sample processing. You separate components of blood or body fluids to be able to detect and identify pathogens. But centrifuges are bulky, expensive, cost around a thousand dollars, and really hard to carry out in the field. And of course, they don't work without power. Sounds familiar? So we started thinking about solving this problem, and I came back. Kept thinking about toys. Now, I have a few with me here.、Uh, I first started with yo-yos, and I am a terrible yo-yo thrower. Because these objects spin, we wondered: could we actually use the physics of these objects to be able to build centrifuges? This was the possibly the worst throw I can make.、Uh, but you might start realizing if you start exploring the space space of toys. We tried these spinning tops. And then in the lab, we stumbled upon this wonder. It's the whirly gig, or a buzzer, or a run run. A couple of strings and a little disc, and if I push, it spins. How many of you have played with this as a kid? This is called a button on a string. Okay, maybe 50% of you. What you didn't realize that this little object is the oldest toy in the history of mankind. 
5,000 years ago, we have found relics of this object hidden around on our planet. Now, the irony is, we actually don't understand how this little thing works. That's when I get excited. So we got back to work, wrote down a couple of equations. If you take the input torque that you put in, you take the drag on this disk and the twist drag on these strings, you should be able to mathematically solve this. This is not the only equation in my talk. Ten、uh, pages of math later, we can actually write down the complete analytical solution for this dynamic system. And out comes what we call paperfuge. That's my postdoc, Saad Bamla, who's the co-inventor of paperfuge. And to the left, you see all the centrifuges that we were trying to replace. This little object that you see right here is a disk, a couple of strings, and a handle. And when I spin, and I push, it starts to spin. Now, when you realize, when you do the math. When we calculate the RPM for this object, mathematically we should be able to go all the way to a million RPM. Now there is a little twist in human anatomy because the resonant frequency of this object is around 10 hertz, and if you've ever played piano, you can't go higher than two or three hertz. The maximum speed we've been able to achieve with this object is not 10,000 RPM, not 50,000 RPM, 120,000 RPM. That's equal to 30,000 g forces. If I was to stick you right here and have it spin, you would think about the types of forces you would experience. One of the factors of a tool like this is to be able to do diagnosis with this. So I'm going to do a quick demo here, where so this is a moment where I'm going to make a little finger prick, and a tiny drop of blood is going to come out. If you don't like blood, you don't have to look at it.、Uh, here is a little lancet. These lancets are available everywhere, completely passive. And、uh, if I've had breakfast today, that didn't hurt at all.、Uh, okay, I take a little capillary with a drop of blood. Now this drop of blood has answers. That's why I'm interested in it. It might actually tell me whether I have malaria right now or not. I take a little capillary, and you see it starts wicking in. I'm going to draw a little more blood. And that's good enough for right now. Now I just seal this capillary by putting it in clay. And now that sealed the sample. We're going to take the sample, mount it on paperfuge. A little piece of tape to make a sealed cavity. So now the sample is completely enclosed, and we are ready for a spin. I am pushing and pulling with this object. I'm going to load this up, and you see the object starts spinning. Unlike a regular centrifuge, this is a counter-rotating centrifuge. It goes back and forth, back and forth, and now I'm charging it up, and you see it builds momentum. And now, I don't know if you can hear this. 30 seconds of this, and I should be able to separate all the blood cells with the plasma. And the ratio of those blood cells to plasma. Already, if you see right here, if you focus on this, you should be able to see a separated volume of blood. And plasma, and the ratio of that actually tells me whether I might be anemic. One of the aspects of this is we build many types of paperfuges. This one allows us to identify malaria parasites by running them for a little longer, and we can identify malaria parasites that are in the blood that we can separate out and detect with something like a centrifuge. Another version of this allows me to separate nucleic acids. To be able to do nucleic acid tests out in the field itself, here is another version that allows me to separate bulk samples, and then finally something new that we've been working on to be able to implement the entire multiplex test on an object like this. So where you do the sample preparation and the chemistry in the same object. Now, this is all good, but when you start thinking about this, you have to share these tools with people. 
And one of the things that we did is we just got back from Madagascar. This is what clinical trials for malaria looks like. <laughs> you can do this while、uh, having coffee. But most importantly, this is a village six hours from any road. Now we are in a room with one of the senior members of the community and a healthcare worker, and it really is this portion of the work that really excites me the most. That smile to be able to share simple but powerful tools with people around the world. Now I forgot to tell you this: that all of that cost me 20 cents to make. Okay, in the negative time I have left, I'll tell you about the most recent、uh, invention from our lab. It's called a buzz. The idea that all of you could help us fight mosquitoes, you could all help us track our enemies. These are enemies because they cause malaria, Zika, chikungunya, dengue. But the challenge is that we actually don't know where our enemies are. The world map for where mosquitoes are are missing. So we started thinking about this. There are 3,500 species of mosquitoes, and they're all very similar. Some of them are so identical that even an entomologist cannot identify them under a microscope. But they have an Achilles heel. This is what a mosquito flirting with each other looks like. That's a male chasing a female. They're actually talking to each other with their wing beat frequencies, and thus they have a signature. We realized. That using a regular phone, a five to ten dollar flip phone, how many remember what this object is? <laughs> We can record these acoustic signatures from mosquitoes, and I'll tell you exactly how to do this. I caught some mosquitoes outside. Unlike Bill, I'm not going to release them, <laughs> but I will tell you how to record from this. All you do is you tap them, and they fly. You can first test. I can actually hear that. And you bring your phone, which has microphones. It turns out the mics are so damn good already, even on regular phones, that you can pick up this near-field signature. And since I'm out of time, let me just play the recording that I made a day ago. This is all the charming sound that you heard before, that you all love. Okay.、Um, one of the contexts of this is being able to do this with a regular cell phone allows us. To map mosquito species, using a flip phone, we mapped one of the largest acoustic database with 25 to 20 species of mosquitoes that carry human pathogens. And from this, in machine learning, anybody who uploads this data, we can identify and tell the probability of what species of mosquitoes you're actually working with. We call this a bus. And if any of you want to sign up, just go to the website. Let me close、uh, with something that's very important and dear to my heart. One of the challenges of today is we have terrible problems. We have a billion people with absolutely no health care, climate change, biodiversity loss, on and on and on. And we hope that science is going to provide the answer. But before you leave this theater today, I want you to promise one thing: we're going to make science accessible, not just to the people who can afford it, but a billion others who can't. Let's make science. And scientific literacy, a human right. The moment that you pass the tingling feeling of making a discovery to another child, you are enabling them to be the next group of people who will actually solve these problems. Thank you.